Ladies and gentlemen, in 1989, I asked some questions. There were some problems. The problems, the issues are, why is it that in the magnificent landscape of theaters in Germany, the wonderful productions that they have of opera and ballet that they spend so much on can't tour to the small venues. They can only put them on in the big theaters. Why are the smaller venues excluded from this? The productions cost a vast amount of money. The singers are there. The dancers are there. The problem is that you simply can't fit an orchestra into the smaller venues. That's where the problem started. So 1989, here I was, conducting in a theater, and I wanted to take these productions on tour. I wanted to do something with them. All these wonderful performers, these skilled people who had dedicated their lives, starting from a very young age to become the best that they possibly could, wanting to share this music and their performance and their skills with the public. And they're restricted to a very small number of theaters. They can't reach out. Then, over the years, I started to do some research. I started to think about this problem to see if we could solve it. Today, there are other problems as well. Why is it that not everybody can engage in what is magnificent about an orchestra? Why can't they all play in an orchestra? Today, we launch. We're at the very beginning, just the beginning, of the Symphonova which is the answer to those problems. It will solve those issues. And it'll do many other things too. But before I got to today, 23 years after I first asked the first question, before I got to today, which is just the start here, I had to address three particular questions. The first question I had to ask was the sound. I'm a classical musician, and I can tell you that no matter how good the loudspeakers are, no matter how expensive, when I listen to them, they don't sound like my Steinway. Sorry. <laughs> Steinways sound different. Why not? Why? And I was able to answer that question almost by chance as I blended together the magic of very good quality conventional loudspeakers like these, with these wonderful panel transverse wave, bending wave loudspeakers that work in a completely different way. They move the air in such random patterns that they provide the image and the semblance of the kinds of reflections that we, this human animal, wants in natural sound. Because natural sound has two components, not just the one of the kind of sound that is produced by these loudspeakers. So I put those together on the same signal. You're not supposed to do that. I did it. And it sounds better. That's the layered sound. Fine. So we now have the beginnings of how to move the air in a manner that acoustically makes a difference. That's very important because in the world of classical, live music making, if I'm going to mix the skill and the talents and the artistry of a great classical musician with a machine, it's got to sound half decent. We're not there yet. It's just a promise. But now we know that we can fulfill that promise. That's a big step. So. Managing expectations. You will not hear beautiful sound today. We're at the beginning, but we have the solutions in hand. So that's the sound. Next step was the gestural control. If I'm going to be working with an instrument in live performance with real musicians who engage with timing and expression, I need to be able to control this device. I need it to work in a way that allows me to perform with it like a live musician. I needed that gestural control. 
And it's only relatively recently that we can do that. And again, today, for the very first time, I'm actually going to be demonstrating that. It's a bit risky. It might not work. <laughs> That's not joking. I'm throwing myself off the cliff here. In public, I've been known to do that before. We'll see. So you'll share with me this experiment effectively. And then thirdly is musical expression. Well, what is musical expression? Well, musical expression is this question of timing. It's color. It's dynamics in classical music. We seek to go from the very finest, softest sound to the very loudest, dramatic sound that we can produce and everything in between with tone colors and God knows what else we will do with our sounds in order to create interest. And we will put our emphasis in strange places of the syllables. <laughs> and we will use timing of events in ways in order to shape the performance so that you have a different experience. <laughs> so we will time things. And we will go to great subtlety as well. So musical expression has this huge vocabulary of potential that can be explored and used and needs to be embedded into the score, into the actual performance of any system that's going to be doing that artificially. So the Symphonova is a digital symphony orchestra. It's a symphony orchestra into which live musicians can be integrated. But not only live musicians of very high quality who can play in the orchestra, but also people who have no clue and no knowledge about music. They can just sit there, and as long as they can follow somebody who gives a beat and says, like that, and they can tap, then we can have a device and have somebody sitting among the orchestra, among the people, or the loudspeakers, and they can engage in making music with other people. It's a nonverbal activity where they can take responsibility for a single instrument or for a section. And they can play with others who are musically trained and so will be playing on their instrument, or they can play with others who are playing a loudspeaker, but not just any loudspeaker and not just any music. So we need that musical expression. Now, to help me with that musical expression, I have a colleague, a performer, an artist, a uh, flautist, Abigail Dolan, who I will now ask to come to the stage. And Abigail is going to, uh, as you see, play a device that's a little bit older than a Symphonova. Very sophisticated machine. And I'm going to demonstrate for you what the machine sounds like, what the Symphonova sounds like without conducting it. Just going to let it play. I'm going to allow you just to hear how this sounds. <clears throat> So you can hear I have my oboist, my clarinet, my bassoon, and my horn. So what's going to happen now? We're going to communicate. I'm going to do something that, to my knowledge, has not yet been done in live performance. I first gave a demonstration of something similar to this in 1995. I wrote a paper about it and presented it at the AES. But this is, to my knowledge, not been done before. So let's try. What am I actually going to be doing? I'm going to conduct 
And Abigail, an artist, a musician, is going to follow me. But there are places in the music where she's also going to lead, and I'm going to have to follow her. And there's going to be an interaction, a kind of nonverbal, a musical communication between us. And the orchestra is going to follow me as well. Abigail is going to be listening to the orchestra and hearing what I'm playing and doing with the orchestra. And she's going to be responding to that input and then doing things musically. That means that whatever performance we're about to give is really unique. We'll never give this performance again. Even if we were to do it a second time, immediately thereafter, there would be subtle differences. And this is the magic of live performance. I celebrate the highest levels of amateur music making, and I'm absolutely dedicated to the highest quality of professional music making that we can find with the greatest of subtlety and the greatest of attention to detail. And I think we have the potential to rediscover <coughs> with professional colleagues the magic of live performance and the subtleties that there are in the greatest of live performance. So it's been a fantastic day today, absolutely amazing talks. It's been a great privilege to meet the other speakers and a particular privilege to close the day. And so I will close the day now with music. <laughs>